uh, tomorrow and the following Sunday if you want to go to where the Holy Ghost party is. 10 o'clock in the morning here for Family Worship Center. There's no party like the Holy Ghost party, right? Why is that? It doesn't stop, right? Okay, so, um, yeah, it'll, it'll be fun. We're, we're going to, um, well, I won't, I won't give you a preview. I'll just make you have to come find out. So, I'm trying to think. I feel like I'm forgetting something, but it must not be that important. So, Okay, so uh, if you would like a <coughs> teaching handout, do you want to pass these out, please? Um, just raise your hand. If you don't want one, that's fine. But we're going to kind of go through an outline here, and we're staying on our, our series in James. Last week, what did we talk about last week? You want to remember? Trials. Thank you. Trials. What? Trials. Trials. So last week we talked about keeping faith in the valley. And, uh, you know, that's, that's not a popular message to preach. <laughs> you know, people want to go hear the blessing message, right? Uh, so into my ministry and you'll be blessed financially, right? Um, you know, we, we like to talk about God's blessings, but the, the reality is, while He does bless us, um, He guarantees that we'll have trials. That's why James says, count it all joy when you face various trials, because we, we come out the end stronger if we learn how to embrace during the storm. And we talked about um, well, we talked about a lot of, regarding storms and why God allows them. But essentially, you know, we look at Jesus in the boat and we can learn that the, the storms that we really have authority over are the ones that we can sleep through. And I know for me, I look back and I'm like, oh, I don't sleep through a whole lot of storms. Uh, I squirm, but getting better, right? But it's a, it's a good thing when you can have a storm come up and you're like, eh, it's going to be fine, right? Because Jesus knew he was going to get there. <clears throat> the disciples saw the waves and they're like, we're, we're not going to make it. So it's just that perspective. So um, we're, gonna, we're actually going to move ahead a chapter, or, yeah, to the next chapter in, in chapter 2 in James. And that's where we're going to focus tonight. Not going to go through a whole big chunk, but um, we're going to go through, well, what we're going to talk about is how to gain love for others. And that comes from chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. So can I have a volunteer who has a Bible come up here and read chapter 2? It's not a really long chapter. Go for it. <clears throat> Just... Uh, while he's reading, you, I mean, you can read along or whatever you want to do, but I would just encourage you, however you soak things in, just soak things in, whether it's just closing your eyes and listening or whatever, um, but just let the word, digest the word, eat it. Can we read the whole chapter? Just one yeah. Six. My brethren... Do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the laws as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, 
but do not commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law, but do commit murder, sorry. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Awesome, thank you. So just to, again, reiterate, James is really in your face about works. Now he's not, you know, some, some people would say it's in contradiction to a lot of Paul's writings, which is you're saved by faith alone, through grace, right? But it's not. What he's saying is, your faith, you know you have it by your works, because you can't believe something and not do it, right? So we know that by our actions, looking at our actions, good or bad, we see what we actually believe by the things we actually do. So he's not talking about being saved through your works. He's talking about showing that you have faith and being able to look at your actions um, to see if you have faith. Does that make sense? Okay, so... Uh, so we're, we're talking about, really, what I could have called this is the least of these, right? Because the, the love that Jesus calls us to is not the love that the world knows. We're called to a different kind of love. One that's unconditional, not conditional on the way we feel or the other person and what they do. So this is a, it's a tough, it's a challenging message, but I think it's really important. We all need to, to be reminded of what kind of standard we're called to, right? So in Matthew 22, verse 36 through 40, um, one of the Pharisees is questioning Jesus and he's asking him, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus basically says, um, love God and love others. On that hang everything. The reason is because the, the things that the law required, um, basically I, what I think Jesus is saying is, look, if you love God and you love other people, you won't sin. Love, if you're compelled by that, and if you're spending time with God and loving people, you're just not going to sin. And, and it's also putting an emphasis on love because it's that important. You know, a lot of people, not that we won't, we, we do get rewards in heaven. You know, scripture talks about getting rewards for the things that we do, not that the things we do don't matter. But I, I guarantee you when we get to heaven, Jesus is not going to say, no, you had good theology. <laughs> right? He's probably going to say something like, you did or didn't love well. Because again, if we get that right, all the other things fall into place. And so we see that the greatest commandments are love, loving God and loving others. And then we also see in 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter. And I think it's fair to say the Corinthian church, based on the way that Paul writes to them, you could say that they're kind of a charismatic church. They don't have any problem with the gifts of the Spirit. What Paul is basically telling the Corinthian church is, look, these gifts are great, 
But number one, if you don't love people, then who cares about the gifts? So if you have love, if you don't have love, you're nothing, is what he says, literally. And the other thing he's saying is, and, and when you do operate in the gifts, this is the proper way to do that. So the Corinthian church, I think, and it would, again, be fair to say they would be, quote-unquote, charismatic with the gifts. But love, he was challenging them with love. Okay, so, so that kind of sets the precedent for what we're talking about. Love is important. But we're going to talk about the people that are hard to love. Because scripture tells us it's, it's not about the person that loves you back or that you get something from that's important to love. That anyone can do that. An evil person can love people that love them. But what about the unlovable person? And so as we talk through these points, um, maybe challenge yourself to be thinking about the person that is easy for you to marginalize, to overlook, to just walk past. And it, it, it's probably so natural to you, you don't even think about the fact that you're doing it. Um, but we all have a person. And for all of us, it's not the same type of person. For some of us, it's a homeless person. For others of us, we love homeless people. We stop and talk to them all the time. For another person, it might be the, the rich businessman, okay? They offend you for some reason. So there, there is almost always a, a person or a people group or a type of person, however you want to say it, that either offends us or that we kind of overlook. They don't need my love. Or we just, again, we don't even think about them. So it's not that we're saying, well, I'm not going to love that person. Maybe it's just a neglect because they're not in our frame of reference. They're not in our perspective. And so challenge yourself as we talk through some of this stuff. Um, just to let the Holy Spirit speak to you about those people um, and challenge yourself. Again, we, we all have room to grow in this area. There's always an area of, of growth to take us a little bit deeper. So the question we're going to go over is basically how do, we, how do we grow in love for other people because we see that it's important. It's like the basis of our faith. They'll know you're Christians by your love, right? And you know, I think elsewhere in Scripture it says they will, they will know by your love for one another. So even the way we love each other. Well, that's, that can be a hard one too because sometimes it's within the, the body of Christ that we have a, a struggle. Well, they should know better. Really? I, I really wanted to, when we started the church the first night, I, I was really tempted to put a sign on the door that said, no perfect people allowed. Because when we think about it, like, yeah, Christians should know better, but we're still as screwed up as the world in many ways. Um, we're just growing up, right? We should be coming out of that. But the church is full of people that, you know, either are just saved and they don't know any better, they're, they're messing their diaper because they're a baby Christian, right? Or they decide to continue to be a baby even when they should be an adult, right? So we have to deal with all kinds of dynamics in the church. But isn't it weird how sometimes it's harder to get along with family than it is with other people? Why is that? And that's a whole other topic, but something to think about. So, again, we're going to be answering these questions or just giving some insight. There's not always concrete answers, but these are things that are that will help you. And, and one of these seven maybe pop out to you. It might just like, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. I need to work on that one. Okay, so the first, number one, if you're following along in the outline, you can write these down. But um, perhaps the most obvious one is ask God. James 4, 2 says, You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Well, that seems pretty simple. You don't have because you don't ask. It's like the knock and you, the door will be open, seek and you will find. You know, It's the same principle, but it's just saying, look, just ask God. Because what we find with love is that it's a supernatural thing. It's not a, it's not a, this is how I feel, right? 
And so we sometimes need to just ask God and say, look, God, I want to love like this, but there's nothing in me wanting to do that right now. But I want to want it. And so he can change our heart. He can transform us. We can't really change ourselves. We can, we make choices on what we act and we make choices of what we ask for from him. But we don't, we don't really, we're not really good at changing ourselves. Real, real change. Right? He does the heart change. So ask him. Uh, number two is act. Again, these, some of these are just painfully simple. But that's the point. You know, because sometimes it is painfully simple. We make things so abstract and profound. And of course, there are mysteries in the Christian faith that will always be there. You know, I mean, the scripture that says, uh, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. We're, there's always a mystery for us to search out. And, and God himself, we will never understand him fully. Um, so there's this thing about mystery that's awesome and intriguing. But there's also a part of it that is made for everyone. It's not just made for the elect. It's not made for pastors. It's, it's a faith that is tangible. It's real. It's simple. You know, sometimes we just need to make it simple. So act is... What are we doing with our actions? The first thing that we learn is that, and you'll see uh, A and B there under this one, <clears throat> is that, first of all, uh, love is a discipline, not a natural response. Real love, right? We're, again, we're, we're bypassing that, well, I love them because they love me. We're bypassing that, and we're going to the standard that, that Jesus sets. Loving the people that don't love us. In fact, they curse us. They hate us. They mistreat us. And the Bible says, bless them and pray for them. Right? So, it's not a natural response to just respond to a person like that and be like, I love you. You want to be like, oh, man, if I could just, right, fill in the blank. So it's a discipline. It takes intentional intention, intentionality. <laughs> Act, okay? And then B, it's a choice, not a feeling, okay? So we have to get past the fact that love is a feeling because it's not. If I loved my wife only when I felt like it, that would be maybe 50% maybe of the time at best, right? But love is laying your life down, and we're going to get to that. And so, by acting, we, we find out, you know, in, in series past, we've talked about um, how we, you know, the, we get transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? So the way we think causes us to, um, to make these actions, right? Sooner or later, by the way we think, we will act. And then actions turn into habits. We do them long enough. And then those habits, when you do habits long enough, it forms your character. And then your character ultimately determines your destiny. And so our mind is really at the forefront of how, how we act upon some of these things. So in this, in this instance, loving, we got to renew our mind. So we walked past and then the, the Holy Spirit convicted us. Oh, we just walked past someone. Like, okay, what are you going to do about it? Go back. And so we, okay, I'm going to go back. And so that's training your mind, those strongholds. You're rerouting those strongholds to think rightly instead of wrongly. And so what we find is what we focus on, we make room for. It's that principle that, like when you buy a new, say you buy a Jeep, all of a sudden, like, everyone's driving a Jeep. Well, no. It's just that that's what's on your mind, so you see them. Right? So we know that what you focus on, you make room for. So again, it's this... What are we making room for in our thoughts? Are we making room for the people that we walk past that we shouldn't? Or are we making room for what I want? Well, I walk past it, man. No big deal. Because you're feeding one or the other, right? And so, again, acting is painfully simple, but it's incredibly difficult because if it goes against our soul and what we want, it's not always that easy. So I'm going to read that scripture that I referenced a couple times. Matthew 5, verse 43 through 48. 
You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you so that you may be sons of the Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Yikes. Perfect? Well, we know that love is perfect. Whether we're perfect or not, love is perfect. And so we are to love. And there's perfection in this love. Again, not the love that we get from someone else, but the love that we give that we get nothing in return. Okay, so... Number three, humble yourself. Again, painfully simple, but incredibly profound at the same time. Philippians 2, verse 3, three through 8, says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for the, your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we see that, you know, Jesus is our example. He was God, and yet he limited himself to us and then died. And he gave everything that he was. He loved us so much he gave. And so we're to do the same thing. That may not mean a physical death, but it probably does mean a death to your soul and your ambitions and your will and your desires and letting those die so that Christ can grow inside of you. But humbling yourself. There's something about, you know, you either fall on the rock or the rock will fall on you. I'd rather fall on the rock because the rock crushing you is not very fun. I've learned that. So we, again, pray and ask God, God, I need humility. That's a dangerous prayer. It's just like asking for patience. And you get behind the slow person. <laughs> okay, number four. Be an intentional, faithful friend to the least of these. Matthew 25, 34 through 40. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Hmm. Interesting. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And we, when, we, uh, when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and come to see you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of the brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did it to me. Well, that's a whole new perspective. So that person that we walk past and the Holy Spirit's like, maybe, maybe you're just supposed to smile at them. Maybe that was it. But the Holy Spirit's reminding us, Well, by the way, um, by you giving up yourself and, and blessing that person and doing whatever love looks like in that moment, um, you actually were going to do that to Jesus himself. So it's not that we do it so that we get, but there's a blessing in like realizing, wow, when I do something to the least of these, I do it to him. I mean, that's what his word says. Wow. So here's a question. It's rhetorical. Um, <clears throat> how many friends do you have?
from which you get absolutely nothing in return. They're not super popular, so you don't get like popularity status for being friends with them. They're not funny or fun to be around. You get nothing from them there. Uh, they don't smell good, so you don't like their aroma isn't pleasing. Um, how many people are you friends with that actually? It's not even that you don't get anything from them, but it's actually hard to be around them. Because those are the people that Jesus was friends with, the sinners, right? That's why he got called a sinner and a drunkard. And so just, again, just something to ponder. Um, who, who are we pouring our life out for? People that give us something in return or people that have nothing to give us? Nothing. I'm not talking about money, obviously. Just... We, we live in a self-centered, selfish culture, and I personally am a product of that. And I've had to fight and fight and fight against that because my culture says, add it your way. Was that McDonald's or something? I don't know. Burger King. Burger King, right? Okay, so everything about our culture says, you do what you want when you want, it's all about you. That's the message that we hear all the time. And it's so contrary to the gospel, it's not even funny. Number five, examine your heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is sick and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? So again, it's that we walk past this person, the least of these. Why do we even do it? Sometimes our, we're deceiving ourselves in our motives because our heart is so deceitful. It can be, Right? that we honestly don't even know what's going on in our own heart. So we have to examine our hearts. You know, it's like, Lord, give me clean hands and a pure heart. Um, reveal to me what's in my heart that is keeping me from knowing what's in my heart, which is keeping me from getting rid of that thing that needs to get rid of. Um, again, painfully simple. I mean, there's nothing like hard about examining your heart. It's just looking inwardly on occasion, trying to, really it's, it's sensitivity to the Holy Spirit is the best way to do this because he is constantly highlighting things to us, but we're so used to constantly ignoring that we don't hear it. We don't sense his promptings. Um, and, and I found this to be true. I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I found it to be true. Uh, one of these deceitful things in my heart is that I almost, when I'm starting to hear the Holy Spirit, I almost don't want to hear it anymore because it's constantly convicting me. It's like, well, I can't change all that. No, I don't want to hear it. You know, and that's not a conscious thing. I don't consciously think like, well, I don't want to hear that anymore. Right? It's just like, I'm going to ignore this because I don't want to hear it. Because I've already been convicted three times today. And I can't handle it anymore. Right? But then I think sometimes that's that condemnation that gets covered up as conviction. And, and again, part of this deceitfulness in our heart, or sometimes the voices that we've heard in our life, whether it's our parents or coaches or who knows, um, we hear true conviction of the Lord, and then we heap our own condemnation on top of it and mix it in, and we can't discern the difference. So we don't want to hear it. Because conviction is really not looking at your sin and look what you did and look what you're doing right now. And, you know, it's like, why don't you try that instead? Oh, yeah, that's a lot better. Right? Because it's focusing on your identity and who you are and what he's calling you to. It's like like we talked about a couple weeks ago, the, the mirror, right? The man who walks, looks at himself in the mirror and then walks away and then forgets what he saw. It's because it's not that we have a sin problem, it's that we have a memory problem. And that may or may not be something I'm going to talk about tomorrow morning. It's our identity. Conviction is constantly pointing us to our identity, not to our mistakes. It's not saying, stop doing that, don't do that, look at you, you bad person. It's saying... Do this, this is who you are. Oh yeah, I don't have any need for that anymore. Identity is so powerful. If we could grab a hold of that, man, I'm, 
I'm, I've been listening to a lot of Todd White lately, and I know I mentioned that maybe last week or the week before, maybe both. I think one of the reasons that I'm being led into a lot of what Todd White shares is because a lot of what he shares is on identity. Now, he's a strong evangelist. I've, I've met few people as strongly evangelistic as him. I mean, he, he can't go to McDonald's without evangelizing to someone. But he does it out of his identity because he is an evangelist. Now, we're all not called to be evangelists. We are, are, all, are all called to evangelize to a degree, but that's not in all of us, but that's in him. And so he does it not out of obligation, like, well, I gotta add another notch to my belt. He does it because he is learning. He, that's something that he carries. It's an anointing he carries, which is so strongly rooted in his identity that he can't not do and be who he is and who he is as an evangelist. So this message of identity is just, man, I'm, I'm eating it up. And I'm realizing that so much of where I want to go is wrapped up in that. It's not always in the do's and the don'ts. That's the law. <clears throat> okay, number six. Oh, here's a, here's a good one you want to hear. This preaches real well. Die to yourself. Matthew 10, verse 38 and 39 says, And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Just a note, this scripture, this reference, this losing your life, pick up your cross and follow me, it's actually so important that it's found twice in Matthew and in one of each of the Gospels. It's not like some obscure scripture. It's like so important that each one of them were led of the Spirit to write that in there. Oh yeah, by the way, pick up your cross and follow me. And I don't know if it's not in every reference, but in some of the references it says, pick up your cross daily and follow me. Because it's, it's not a salvation mentality which says, okay, I'm saved, I, I, my old life is dead. It's, okay, old me is wanting to creep up and we're cutting it off and putting it on the cross. Then old me is wanting to creep up and cutting it off, putting it on the cross until it's not a problem anymore. So it's a daily walk of becoming more and more and more completely given over to Him. You know, um, I'm thinking out loud here, which is kind of dangerous, but if, if everything demonic is only a counterfeit, what's the real of demon possession? It's Holy Spirit possession. So if we think of people that are demon possessed as like they do things that they don't even know they're doing, Right? I mean, that's kind of what you think of when you think of a demon-possessed person. They're not in their right mind. Well, we shouldn't be in our right mind with the Holy Spirit. We should be so possessed by Him that we do things that aren't who we are in our flesh, but they're who we are in our new creation. Just a thought. So get possessed. <laughs> then, yeah, there's... I'll, I'll name that in a sermon title one of these days. It'll be good. So again, just remember the, the importance of losing yourself because if yourself is the focus, you're never going to love the least of these. It's just impossible because they have nothing to give you. And it's, again, important enough that it's in every single gospel. It's not in Acts, if you consider that the gospel, but it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and in Matthew twice. And the last one, and probably the most important one, Develop an intimacy with the Lord. In Him is our identity. In Him is who we are. And everything that we do should come out of who we are. We don't do things to become. We do things because we are. Right? So how many of you know you have a friend that you hang out with, maybe for a season, maybe back in high school when you had this friend and like, for two years, you guys were like this. All you did was stuff with this person. You start to become like them. 
right? You, you become like each other. And the same thing kind of happens when you get married. You're around someone so much that, you know, you finish their sentences, you know what they're thinking, you know their personality so well that if someone said that they did or said something, you would know, like, no, I know them, they wouldn't do that. That is what it should be like with us in the Lord. We should know Him so well that we actually become like Him. And we know Him so well that we know what He would and wouldn't say. So if you want to hear the Lord speak in your life, and you're not reading the Word regularly, there's probably, well, let me just say, read your, read your Bible. Like, He's given us His written Word, which, like, tells us all about His character. And then when we think we hear or don't hear something that is or isn't the Lord, we can discern because we have His Word in us. And we get so washed with the Word that we can say, like, no, that's not the Holy Spirit because He wouldn't say that. Right? Amen. So we need to be washed with the Word and develop intimacy with the Lord. You know, I said this before, but we, we do a really good job in church of teaching people to come get excited about a great speaker and a great worship band and, and do all these things, but we do a poor job, generally, of teaching people to be alone with God. And that's like the most important, right? Now, I mean, I, granted, it's, it's kind of hard to teach in a corporate setting, and I understand that. But are we giving time for that? Are we teaching and, and living a life in front of people, even corporately, that says, like, this is so valuable, we're actually going to take time and we're going to wait on the Lord, we're going to listen to Him, we're going to be with Him, we're going to pray, we're going to, you know, whatever that looks like. Um, <clears throat> I just think that's so important. It will change you. You can't encounter the light and the light not affect you. It's impossible. You can't give God the opportunity and spend time with Him and have it not change you. It's impossible. In Him is life. And our crap and flesh and sin and darkness and all that stuff, guess what? It's not more powerful than He is awesome and good and pure and holy. You're not going to infect him. It's the other way around. And the same thing is true when you walk about in your day. We often think, oh, well, I'm not going to that place. That place is dark. Man, it's a dark place. So bring the light there. Are they going to darken you? It doesn't work that way. We watched, uh, the interns and I watched um, The Holy Ghost Reborn. Have any of you guys seen The Finger of God, The... Um, Father of Lights, Holy Ghost, Furious Love, the, the, those series. If you haven't, you need to watch them. They're so good. Well, the latest one that came out is Holy Ghost Reborn, and uh, Todd White is with a group of people, and they're filming this documentary, and they're in Rome, and there's a mob of college students. Like, I don't know what they were protesting against, but you could literally hear, like, the, you know, the crops, the, the mob sound, and and of course Todd White's like, I'm going in the middle of there. And see, he literally goes like running towards the, and they're all like with the cameras, like, yeah, I'm not sure if we want to do this, you know. He's like, man, where would Jesus be? He'd be right in the middle of there. So he like goes, they have like this banner, and he like walks under the banner and like parts through people and starts walking in. And he's like putting his hands on everyone and praying for people, and I mean. Again, like, there's a, he's crazy, okay, in a good way. But he understands something. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. What can they take from me? They have nothing to take from me. And he even literally said, what's the worst that could happen? They punch me, I don't care, I'm going in there. And it turns out they had this awesome encounter. You know, I won't tell you the whole thing, but they meet some guy that they run into later, and, and I don't want to give you a spoiler. But that was found in the midst of chaos. So somehow we, we need to change our mindsets. The world desperately needs us. The least of these de desperately need us. Not us. They need Christ in us. But we're the ones that 
Jesus, for whatever reason, I think it was a bad idea, but he is way smarter and knows everything than me. He thought it was a good idea to, to choose us to reveal himself to the world. And so, obviously, he has our failures and inadequacies and all that factored into the equation already, or he wouldn't have done it. But we still get to choose, like he's either going to use you, or he's going to use someone else that says, I'm willing, right? And so we need to start seeing through the eyes of the Father, which we get through spending time with him, because we start learning. This is how he thinks. This is how he feels. This is what he, he believes. This is who I am. This is who he is. And we start living out of that instead of the law, like do's and don'ts. I did a, had a good day. I didn't sin, right? It's like, yeah, but were you who you are? That's the important thing. And I think if we embrace this, we'd see a little bit, we would see differently, but I think the world, we would see the world becoming different through the Lord in us. We would start going to the darkness and bringing the light and transforming it. There's something cool about that. So I'll stop rambling. Okay, so meditation point. This week, as you are meditating and praying and spending time with the Lord, just reflect on, this is kind of that question I, the hypothetical, or hypothetical, rhetorical question that I posed earlier. Who are those people that you overlook, marginalize, whatever? Who are the least of these in your life? Because it's going to be different for everyone. That have nothing to give you. How many people are you like, I am friends with this person. I regularly pour out for them. I just sit and listen or whatever that looks like. They have nothing to give me. But I have something to give them. And maybe it's just a listening ear. Maybe it's a smile. Maybe it's ten bucks or whatever. But are we intentional about that? Again, that's that number two act. Intentionality. And then the challenge point is pick one of these people. Again, this is not just to write down and be like, oh yeah, this is a good challenge for someone to do. It's a good challenge for you to do. So challenge yourself to pick one of these people. And maybe you don't know, maybe it'll happen in the moment. You're like, that's my person. But decide ahead of time that this week you're going to pick someone and you're going to randomly and extravagantly bless them. So we talked about our life, giving up our life. You know, Christ loved us so much that he gave. So we should do the same. And I'm not saying that it's necessarily like financially or whatever, but if it is financially, be extravagant about it. Do something that blows them away that says, okay, you're not normal, what's wrong with you? Oh yeah, I'm not normal actually. I have the Holy Spirit in me. You don't have to be weird about it, but but let's be extravagant in our love and in our blessing. So pick this person. You may it may already be in your head. You may already know who it is. It may come throughout the week. But if you pray about it, guarantee the Lord will give you someone to do this for. And just set your your heart to bless them. You know, sometimes we, we see people on the street and we, we want to impact them, but we, we handicap ourselves because we're like, well, I don't, didn't hear the Lord tell me what to say or do. Does he need to tell you what to say or do? Like if some homeless guy is sitting on the street corner, like, you don't have to have a word of knowledge for him. You don't have to heal him of every disease he's ever had. Maybe the Lord is like, um, just love the guy. Look at all the 50 million other people that walk by him and don't even look at him. Or maybe they throw some money at him. Like, maybe you just sit with him. Ask him questions. You know, treat him like a human being. That you would, you know, you would ask someone that you could get something from about themselves. Right? So, don't get hung up on, like, needing to know, I mean... Yeah, Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. And so, it, 
I'm not like discounting the importance of being in the spirit and being led of the spirit in what you do and don't do. That's huge. Um, but sometimes we're waiting on God to do something he's told us to do. And so sometimes telling us to do that is like, oh, I already told you in scripture to feed the homeless and to be a, to love the widows and the orphans and take care of them. And I don't need to tell you to do that, right? Again, I'm not, I'm not pushing a performance mentality. I'm just trying to give you freedom to just like love people. Sometimes there's so much power just in that alone. So, <clears throat> so let, let's pray, but um, after we pray and go our own way, if, you, if something is stirring in you and you feel like, man, I need, it may not be in this area, it probably would make sense, but in any area of your life where you're like, I need breakthrough, like the Lord has been convicting me and has been on me, and I know that this thing has been on my mind that I, I want to grow in or I want to break through this area, but I'm just not seeing it or, um, or you need a jump start or whatever. Um, just come and find me afterwards and, and we'll pray for you, okay? Because there's, there's power in prayer of agreement, so we want to do that. Um, you know, prayer is not just a religious activity, but it's actually asking God to actually do something. And so don't ignore something that the Lord is stirring in you. Let's do something about it. And if there's any, if it's an area where I've had success personally, then I'll talk you through um, maybe steps to help you grow in that area. If it's, if it's not, then I'll direct you to someone that, that is good and, and excels in that area. I don't pretend to know what it is that the Lord is stirring, but, um, but just be, be intentional about that. So, cool. So, Father, um, Lord, we just we want to reflect you. We want to be like you. We want to worship you. And we know that your word is all about love. So, Lord, I just repent for the ways that I have uh, overlooked and marginalized people that maybe even were an angel in disguise. And I miss the blessing to bless them. But Lord, I, I, I ask you to change my heart where, where there's deceit. Change my heart where um, there's anything that doesn't line up with your perfection. Lord, give us all a conviction of your Holy Spirit to move in a direction that is towards our identity in you. And Lord, we ask that our families, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, our schools, everywhere that we frequent would begin to look differently because of your Holy Spirit in us. That it wouldn't be contained within us, but that it would be the leaven that you put in a loaf and it comes out and affects everyone around us, Lord, because you are the light of the world. And we don't hide that light. We want to shine it. So, Lord, take us out of a performance mentality. Take us out of sin management and put us in a place of identity as sons and daughters. Who you created us to be, the gifting you've given us, the calling you've given us, which is each unique to us. And release us, Lord, to do that in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our workplaces, everywhere we go. Let us walk in the freedom and the truth that is your perfect love. And help us fear you and nothing else. Lord, we just give you honor and glory because you are good. And Lord, just forgive us where we've made it about us when it's really about you.